Welcome everyone. I'm going to wait just a bit before we get started. Welcome to tonight's session. I'm John Givens, the chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures, and I'll repeat that introduction and introduce my two colleagues when I see that the that the participant list has finished populating and we'll take the next hour to talk about uh, the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures, classes, clusters, minors, majors. We'll answer all, the, all your questions that you might have about studying languages, literatures, cultures, cinema in our department, studying abroad, transfer credits, um, any questions you might have. So welcome to our session tonight. And uh, we're recording the session for uh, those who, could, who can't be here tonight. And, and obviously, if you want to revisit the session tonight, you can, you'll have a chance to do so. But we will also uh, make ourselves available for questions. And, and, and in fact, if you have questions that come up after the session, you'll be able to, to email us and we'd be happy to follow up. So I'll reiterate, it looks like we're at a stable population. My welcome to the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures uh, admissions event. Uh, we are very happy to be here this evening and hope we can uh, fill you in on what it's like to study in our department. So in this session, let me just go ahead and share my screen. I've got a, an informational slideshow we'll begin with and uh, in about uh, 15 minutes or so, we should be able to open the session up for questions, 15, 20 minutes. <clears throat> let me get this um, up. Here we go. Uh, modern languages and cultures. Uh, here are your hosts, as I mentioned earlier, I'm John Gibbons, professor of Russian, chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures. There's my email. And joining me to, today are two of my colleagues, Shizuka Hardy, assistant professor in Japanese, and Anna Rosenzweig, assistant professor in French. Our presentation today will include an overview of MLC, as I mentioned, clusters, minors, majors. We'll talk about some important questions. We'll have some, some uh, input on some recommended classes for your first year of study. We'll have a couple of important links up at one uh, part uh, of the presentation, and then we'll turn to questions. Questions can be, um, can be entered in the Q&A function, and we will look at those uh, as we get to that section. <clears throat> so I begin with this kind of cheesy slide and uh, our, our bold slogan, MLC, we bring you the world. So here is uh, a nice world map. Uh, we, um, uh, you know, on, on this world map, there really isn't a continent where one of the 10 languages that we teach is not spoken. Uh, in fact, um, in our department, you can, you can study up to 10 languages and cultures. Chinese, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Polish, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. In fact, we teach uh, half of the 10 most spoken languages in the world. And the ones that we teach of, the, of that list of 10 include Chinese, Spanish, French, Russian, and Portuguese. Uh, that's because uh, many of these languages are spoken in more than one country. So here's a map showing you French speaking regions of the world uh, in North America, South America, Africa, Europe, and uh, Southeast Asia. And indeed, even uh, in the subcontinent of India. Similarly, uh, the Spanish-speaking countries of the world, North and South America, Spain, of course, and one country there on the coast of Western Africa. Portuguese-speaking countries uh, include the country of Brazil, uh, Portugal, countries in Africa, uh, Southeast Asia as well. Russia is spoken in uh, Russia, which covers 11 time zones and the former republics of the Soviet Union and Mongolia. And 
finally, of course, let's not forget that 1.3 billion people speak Chinese. That's about one seventh of the world's population. And we teach Chinese as well. Now, the nice thing about our department is that we combine the practical and the intellectual. We offer proficiency in a language. We teach critical and analytical skills, which themselves are job skills. Uh, we introduce you to cultural otherness, cultural alterity. When you uh, take uh, classes in our department to study abroad, you will be uh, studying, confronting alterity. You yourself will, will as you go abroad and in, in, in study in a language who's, who's who, in a country whose language you, you, <clears throat> you, you speak, you will become uh, yourself uh, a, a different person. You'll experience your own alterity. Uh, and you, we'll also give you the opportunity to grapple intellectually with writers, artists, and thinkers from across the globe. So there is the, there are practical aspects, there are intellectual aspects about studying in our department that make it really one of the most popular departments in the uh, university. As a matter of fact, we are the most heavily enrolled humanities department. And in most semesters, we also are the most heavily enrolled of all the social science departments. We're usually only behind uh, five or six science departments. So we're a popular uh, uh, department and uh, we have a lot of offerings, a lot of courses that you might be interested in. You might have heard about MLC clusters. There are one way that, that we um, fulfill divisional uh, requirements in the college, uh, divisional requirements in the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. Three courses that are related uh, form a cluster which will fulfill a divisional requirement. We offer really an astounding 45 clusters in our language, culture, and comparative literature offerings across the department. We average about 191 students uh, declaring an MLC cluster each year. And our clusters come in different kinds of packages. We have language clusters, three courses in a language uh, at all levels. We offer uh, clusters in literature, culture, and cinema taught <clears throat> in translation and also in the target language. We offer clusters combining these two options, and we uh, offer uh, clusters in our comparative literature program. Comparative literature is uh, the study of, of, of other uh, cultures and, 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 and literatures uh, across interdisciplinary and international boundaries. So a popular place to fulfill MLC clusters if you only have the ability to take a few classes in our department. But let's say, uh, on here, and here are some examples of our clusters. Uh, Japanese language and culture, Hispanic film and popular culture, Germany before Nazism, Russian studies, Francophone culture, comparative film traditions, an introduction to comparative literature. Here are seven of the 45 or so clusters that we offer. Now, if you have time to take some more courses, it's possible that, uh, two to three courses beyond your cluster, you might be able to declare an MLC minor, depending on how you come in on the cluster. So uh, minors in, in, in our department are usually five to six courses beyond the elementary level. Uh, they usually combine language and literature courses. This is another popular option for students. We have about 73 students declaring a minor each year in MLC. And finally, if you have the ability to and you, you become very interested in the coursework that you're doing in our department, you might consider majoring in our department. 37 students a year graduate on average with an MLC major. Uh, a typical MLC major is composed of foundation courses, core courses, and elective courses. We have two foundation courses that focus on critical thinking, uh, analytical writing, and theory. You'll be doing research, uh, original research in the MLC research seminar and you will be delving into uh, different topics uh, that are applicable to all the programs in our department in the Complet 200 uh, Topics and Critical Thinking uh, series, which focuses on broad uh, 
topics such as uh, war, belief, labor, disability, uh, censorship, uh, uh, anti-heroes, um, horror. These are some of the topics that have been taught or will soon be taught in our Topics in Critical Thinking series. These are courses in which all majors come together to study and they fulfill up a level writing in the major. Uh, we have 46 core courses in each language, usually combining advanced language, literature, culture, and cinema study. And then another, another three or more electives in language, literature, and culture to round out your, your, your major uh, in the elective category. And remember, we'll talk about study abroad here in more detail in a minute, but you can transfer study abroad credits directly into the major, up to four courses in the major, up to two courses in the minor. So if you study abroad, it's a great way to get a good start on a major or a minor in our department. And this is just a slide showing you the book covers of some of the um, publications of our department. The research faculty in MLC is very active. Uh, we uh, do a lot of uh, uh, courses that come out of our research and um, we uh, do more than, than, than teach language at all levels. We also investigate international literature, film and culture in a deeply intellectual way, and you will too, studying in MLC. So a nice little montage of book covers for you to look at. And uh, we're gonna talk about some common questions before we get to your questions. So I'll now open up our slideshow here to my colleagues, Professor Hardy and Professor Rosenzweig. Uh, the question is, what if I wanna continue studying a language that I've already started learning in high school or that I come to uh, college with a kind of a heritage background. So I'll open this up to my colleagues to talk a little bit about continuing a language in MLC. Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in first. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Rosenzweig. And like Professor Gibbon said, I'm an assistant professor in the French program. And we get a lot of students in the French program who have some background in French, either in high school or, you know, maybe through a family connection. Um, and what happens is basically as soon as they, as soon as possible when they're admitted, usually over the summer, they, you would take a placement test. And then based on that placement test, um, that's how we know which course um, that, that you'll go into. And so either, it, sometimes it's like an advanced beginner, sometimes it's intermediate, sometimes it's more advanced. And sometimes students come in and they, they'll jump right into the core courses for a French major, for example. It's very similar for the other, um, the other uh, language programs, you take a test. Um, I think it's it's a bit different in Japanese, so I let my, my colleague talk about that. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead, Shizuka. Okay. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Shizuka Hardy. I'm an assistant professor of uh, Japanese. About the Japanese placement test, um, we actually have an individual placement test so it's more likely a traditional style, pencil and a paper kind of style. So um, my uh, curly professor Tamate is actually in charge of the placement test. But what you need to do is like, as a, um, Professor Rosenway said, um, before the uh, orientation, maybe during the summertime, you can uh, email to Professor Tamate and then make your appointment when you can take your placement test. And then hopefully you can take a placement test in person, but who knows, so it could be in a Zoom. I'm not sure you guys are familiar with Zoom, but if it's the Zoom, um, you will meet Professor Tamate via Zoom and then um, she'll ask you a couple of um, basic questions, how many years you're learning the Japanese and what kind of textbook you used then. Um, she'll give you the placement test. It's most likely a writing piece and then, um, you will send to a breakout room so you can work on the test um, on your own. Then it will check in, um, you know, two or three times throughout the uh, um, when you're taking the test. Then in, in the end, um, you just hand it in and it will let you know which level you can start the uh, Japanese class. So that would be the kind of Japanese placement test. And I, I think one of the things that you're seeing here on this slide is some, you know, some of the programs have online placement tests, others have language placement interviews, and then for Japanese, there's a written test. And I think that's 
emblematic of something that happens in modern languages and cultures in this department where we're one unified department, but then we're also a collection of different programs. And we, mm -hmm. you know, we, um, I think that's one of the most exciting things about our department is these different programs get to learn from each other and we all work closely together. And so say, you know, you're interested in French and Japanese, mm -hmm. Shizuka and I, for example, Professor Hardy and I, excuse me, for example, would, um, you know, would, would coordinate, see where we work yeah, so exactly. closely together that we're on a first name basis. Um, <laughs> so anyway, all that to say, um, I think there's also, especially with languages like French um, and Spanish, there's, I'm, I'm sure others too, some students come in having already taken tests in high school, like the AP and, or the IB, and we do factor those into placement, but they don't take the place of our, our own incoming placement tests. And then similarly, the placement tests, have, you know, they're, they're tried and true and, and, and they work really well. That's, you know, why we keep using them. But that doesn't mean that say you do get into a class in the fall and it's not quite the right level, there's this period of time at the beginning of the semester where your instructor, you know, might um, might adjust your placement. And so it's it's designed to give you a starting point, a jumping off point, and then we'll adjust as needed. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just add to this that the placement test <clears throat> can be found uh, on the web, on the homepage of MLC. You can um, click on placement. It will give you instructions on where in your Blackboard uh, your student Blackboard uh, account, you can find the placement test and you will find them for um, uh, Chinese and, and Italian and Russian and German and Spanish and French. And you'll take the test, it'll give you a score. It'll also come with some questions about how long you've taken the language and whether you have heritage background. And that information uh, will be communicated to the placement person in each of the different programs of the department. Your AP and IB scores will also factor into the placement. They'll help us figure out what level you, you, should, be, you should be at. And depending on your AP or IB scores, uh, you might come in at um, an advanced level, for instance, and if you get a B plus or higher, we will grant you credit for one or both of your intermediate sequence. And, and uh, that can count toward, uh, toward major and minor credit as well. So APIB scores can be activated that way. Uh, it depends on the program though, and there is a page at the University of Rochester a webpage that goes into the details where all the IP, uh, AB and IB scores are and, and what they mean for each of the different programs. They're close to each other in, in policy, but there are slight differences as well. And, and I'll just reiterate what my colleague, colleagues uh, say. Our goal is to place you where you belong, and we certainly don't want to place you too high or too low. Too high, you're gonna be swimming and lost. Too low, you're gonna be bored. Uh, so we wanna get you right where you need to go. And that's the process of the placement, um, uh, the, the placement process that we try to pursue. And this is something that you should think about taking somewhere uh, mid-summer, uh, so that in August, we can already start looking at your test scores and coming up with a preliminary placement for you. You have questions about it you'll get in contact with your placement advisor in the programs and all that information is on our website we'll move on to here to the next question what if i want to start a new language shizuka uh, a lot of people don't take japanese in high school so they might come here and decide to take japanese or for that matter russian is what i teach um, you know what if they want to start a new language what can we tell them about starting a new language in mlc sure um i just um, I just want to briefly talk to you about the benefits of learning a new language here at the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures. I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about learning a new language but not have the opportunity? Maybe uh, you like Korean dramas or Japanese animes or you like BTS but didn't have the chance to learn more about the language and the culture. You're here at the AMOC. Of course, um, we have European languages and also Asian languages. <clears throat> when you start college, you may have a career path in mind, but this is also a time to, for you to explore and find a new interest or field of study. You may have a major, um, you may have a major, but you can also be curious about new subjects. 
I think learning a new language is a great example of that. When you take language classes here at the MOC, you will have classmates from all different majors and programs and a background. So of course you can make a great connection with those classmates you might never have met otherwise. And also, unlike in high school at the MOC, you can study a new language quite deeply and make a great progress in a short time. For example, I teach elementary and um, intermediate Japanese classes and then most of my students tend to feel like they are learning a lot, even in the first semester. So they get really interested in the language and then continue to take more classes and then perhaps even minor or um, major in Japanese. And then I do know some of the students do study abroad in Japan. So what's more, uh, we have a great culture classes as well about film studies and then uh, contemporary or traditional literature and a pop culture and even more. So this means you're learning a language in the context of culture. So I tell you, it's a great opportunity that you may only have in university. I believe there's no field that isn't supported by having another language. Even if you don't minor or major in a foreign language, you will still gain the benefit of learning to read and write and speak from a new perspective. Learning a new language opens your mind to new ways of thinking. It will help you grow as a person and be able to see the world very differently. I say it's a real 21st century skill. So I'm hoping some of you here tonight will take <laughs> our language classes as a very new. I'll just uh, follow up with <laughs> what Chizuka said by, by mentioning that I went to college and began taking Russian, had no idea that I would end up majoring in Russian, had no idea I would end up going to graduate school, had no idea I'd end up going into teaching. So, uh, you know, the, the idea of taking Russian, uh, which was, you know, such a, a different kind of, of language from any I had studied in high school, presented an opportunity that changed my life. And uh, that's what college is about. You're going to explore, you're going to, uh, try to uh, f find out where your passions are. And for me, I had an unexpected passion for the Russian language. So uh, again, if, if you want to start something, uh, start a new language in UR, it could lead you uh, into unexpected outcomes. Uh, we're gonna go from here to another question you probably have. What, what do students do with MLC majors after college? What are some of the uh, things that our alumni have ended up doing? Again, I'll open it up to my colleagues, uh, Professor Rosenstock, if you want to start. Sure. And in fact, as we were talking about this question of um, starting to learn a new major or a new language when you're that, that wasn't offered in high school, maybe, but when you come to MLC, I was just thinking of one of our recent graduates who was a French major. And then around her junior year, she also started taking Korean. And she got really interested in Korean. And with a background in both of those, she um, she had the enviable um, she was in the enviable position of when she graduated of trying to decide whether or not she was going to do a Fulbright in Korea or take a job at Google, and I think that's a really really good example of sort of all of the various kinds of things that that an MLC you know major and 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 opening up you know new courses of study can offer you. A couple of other quick examples is. I have a recent um, MLC graduate who I've worked with who just got into business school and she's told me that, you know, her, the, the sort of attention to detail, but also sort of big, broad thinking is one of the things that, that she felt like really stood out in her application. And then another student who is right now completing a, um, a master's degree in French um, at Oxford University. And so I feel like that really runs the gamut, right? You have Fulbright, Oxford, also Google and uh, business school. And so there's lots and lots and lots of different things that you can, you can do with an MLC major. Um, I, I will mention uh, that one of my students um, <clears throat> ended up going to, to Russia and becoming learning about Russian uh, business, the business world in Russia. And he ended up actually uh, developing his own vodka and marketing it worldwide. And uh, 
It's a prize winning vodka. I'm not promoting uh, vodka, but I'm just saying that's an unusual path that, that he took as a, as a Russian studies major. We have uh, a lot of students though who go on to med school or law school and for them a, a, a second major in another language sets them apart uh, from the applicant pool and uh, kind of bespeaks a broader global outlook that many of our uh, majors who have gone through medical school or, or law school say, say they think help them with both their preparation for those, uh, those professional schools, but also getting into those schools. Uh, Professor Hardy. Uh, yes, I have to say a lot of the, um, uh, the students who majored and minored in Japanese, I think they want to try their language skills. So they actually look for a teaching English job in Japan through um, the Japan Exchange and the Teaching Program known as a JET program. This is a very prestigious, um, the government program. So they get a job through that and then start working there as a um, kind of like a teaching assistant type of job. Then and on the side, they can practice their Japanese living in Japan. Then from there, they can actually um, branch out into other fields in companies like Rakuten, which is the uh, uh, biggest uh, um, online shopping company or the uh, Bandai, which is um, like a toy, the big toy company in Japan, or start their own companies like translation companies and stuff like that. So they do really well because they, um, they learn uh, different languages. So they have the ability to um, like to cope with different cultures and a, you know the style of living and then they know they have a different perspective so a lot of companies appreciate those values can i just oh, go ahead can i just jump in too because i think one of the themes that's emerging here is that it's not just that you've learned a new language right that you've acquired um a new language i think what my colleagues and i are, are emphasizing is that the process that it like the skills that it takes to learn that language is all are, are themselves in addition to you know being able to communicate um, you know it, with a broader range of people it's it's those those added skills that learning a language and learning how to navigate in a different culture gives you i think that that really opens opens things up to mlc majors yeah not just to learning a new language or continue to learn a foreign language. I think you gain the benefit of, like I said, you know, how to, what can I say? Like understand the, um, other people's perspective like better. Yeah, exactly. And it's already like, I, we're both saying like, it's not just learning a language, like learning a language is already a lot, right? But mm -hmm. it's like all of these other things too. Mm -hmm. And we can follow up on this in the Q and A as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go on to our next slide. And that's and one of the things that, um, that students ask when they get to Rochester is, how do I get off campus? So uh, one way you can get off campus, way off campus, is by going abroad. So we would like to talk about study abroad options here at, uh, in, the, in the department. Um, Professor Rosenzweig. Um, would it be okay, Professor Givens, if I, if I jump to one of the Q&As because they're related to this, or should we Absolutely. wait? Absolutely. Let's should go ahead. Wait? Please. Okay, so before we get to study abroad, there's a lot to say there, but I'm just noticing that an anonymous attendee said, do you have any um, classes or resources for studying languages such as Arabic, Farsi, or do Hebrew, or languages outside those you listed? So a few of those are taught in another department at the, uh, at the University of Rochester. They're taught in religion and classics, definitely Arabic and Hebrew. Um, the others, I'm not sure. And then another um, attendee asked, what if you want to learn a language not currently taught in the language program? Um, and that one I'm, I'm not sure about. Um, I wonder if that might be something we need to come back to. Um, right, the, the two departments in which there are uh, other languages, world languages being taught are religion and classics and, and MLC. And in religion and classics, you get ancient Greek and Hebrew and Latin and Arabic. Uh, and Turkish taught, too, right? Turkish is, Turkish is no longer taught there. Oh, okay. So, it's, so those are the ones that are reliably taught over there Then you get our languages in our department. And so between the two of those, you get something like uh, 14 languages reliably taught in at the university. And beyond those, uh, I think you'd have to have uh, 
you know, some sort of immersive experience abroad or in summer to, to uh, pursue languages that aren't in that, in those in the groups of, in, the, in the languages we mentioned already. So, okay, and um, let us, uh, let's see here, there's another qu a question. If a student wants to learn a language not taught in the language department, are there ways to conduct independent studies or research opportunities that would allow a student to learn a language? Possibly, you'd have to, you would have to find someone in the faculty who knew the language maybe someone in the linguistics department who might have facility in a language that they use for for their uh for for their research uh like uh you know some of the uh native indian languages there are linguists who who, who do that or hawaiian the native hawaiian languages that are interesting for linguists that you might be able to do i had a student who was going to do um, an independent study uh, with a professor in um, in an Indonesian language, I think in Indonesian, as a matter of fact. So that's possible uh, to do a little more. Uh, it, it needs to be it needs to be uh, organized, obviously, but but possible. Um, and then I wonder if I just, if you're on a science pre med track, how can an MLC major help you? Um, I mean, I think that is related to what we were talking about a little bit already about how it's, you know, you're learning new linguistic skills, you're learning how to interact with other cultures, which I think we've seen is incredibly important, you know, in, in times of public health crisis like now, but at other times too. Um, but then also you're learning how to do this really, really difficult combination of things, which is one to be super rigorous and analytical, and then at the same time, be really, really comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty, right? Because there's the rules of a language and there's, you know, cultural norms, but then there's this, there's the live moment of encounter and when you're using thing. And so I think there are lots of ways that, 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 that could really, really help you, um, you know, in a, in a more scientific and, and pre-med track, so. Should I go to study abroad, Professor Gibbons? Let's go to study abroad. Okay. Um, sounds great. Okay, so study abroad. So there's a few options. So some of our programs have what are called faculty led study abroad programs. French is one of those. It's one that I've co directed in the past, hope to co direct in the future as soon as we can get back to, to traveling. Um, and what those are, are, are they're, um, they're basically like taking a semester long class, except it's condensed, it's very intensive over the summer and it's in country. So the one in the French program is in, as you can see on this list, it's the one in Rennes, France. Um, and um, those are, I think, really, really exciting opportunities because you're getting the benefits of being on study abroad, being in country, but then also getting to sort of travel and research, um, travel and think with some of your professors, you know, who, who have spent a lot of time in, in those countries. I mean, you're getting the benefit of their, their experience and their research. Sometimes those, you know, so there's Berlin, Germany, Granada, Spain, Prochida, Italy, Quito, Ecuador, Rennes, France, St. Petersburg, Russia, and Seoul, South Korea. Um, and then sometimes those don't always fit into people's schedules and, and sometimes people are interested in a longer opportunity. And so the University of Rochester's Office of Education Abroad, um, you know, partners with some of these um, international entities that have semester long programs set up. Um, and there's so there's too many of those to list. There's lots and lots and lots of different opportunities. Um, and oftentimes those, um, the, the credits that you earn during those opportunities, those semesters abroad can be transferred into um, your MLC, um, your MLC major or sometimes other majors. I know I have some, some students who are French and political science double majors. And so as part of their political science program, they did a semester long study abroad in Belgium in Brussels at the European Parliament um, and French speaking did, a, you know, and, and so those courses and that work that they did, there was a lot of overlap with their French major. So they were able to get credit in that way too. And, and I'll add too, um, for the question about international relations, international affairs, uh, the d degree in international relations in political science requires study abroad. And as far as pursuing uh, individual interests in things like peacemaking negotiations and things like that, uh, that is quite possible to do if you find the right study abroad opportunity. 
uh, you'll take a program uh, somewhere uh, that offers coursework or internships uh, linked to that. And the Education Abroad does a great job of provide of linking students up with those opportunities. Uh, what we do in MLC is get you ready for that experience by teaching you about the culture uh, and uh, the language uh, where you will be residing and pursuing these opportunities. And then you will, you know, find the, some, the study abroad that, 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 you know, fulfills that expectation on your part. The summer programs, I want to add, uh, because they are offered at a time when outside of the usual uh, student financial aid and scholarship uh, period, uh, we have a, a, a generous uh, a Mildred Burton Traveling Fellowship that students of need can apply for and uh, get aid to going for the four-week study abroad uh, programs in the summertime. So for those people who are on tight uh, academic schedules and can't afford to take a semester off, they can go on a summer program and actually get aid to go there through the MLC uh, summer abroad programs and the Burton, uh, the Mildred Burton Traveling Fellowship Fund. Uh, Another thing I should add too is like there's a, a real diversity of experiences on some of these faculty on all study abroad programs, but um, you know, in, in some of them, like the again, the one I know the best is the Hen program. Um, you're staying with host families in Hen. I think that's uh, my doorbell, which I'm gonna let the other uh, member of my household handle. But um, so you'd be staying with host families, you might hear doorbells ring and see how that's handled. Um, uh, Anna, can I uh, briefly yes. talk about the Japanese program? Just yes, so please, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the Japanese program, I think the university has exchanged programs with universities in Tokyo. So I think one is a Meiji Gakuin University and then the other one is the Waseda University. Especially the Waseda University is a, a really good university in Japan, it's very well known. Um, I think for the Japanese uh, study abroad program, you will apply through the Center for Education Abroad. And then they also have a um, they also use the organization called the IES, and you can also apply for the other type of the study abroad programs through the IES. And I will say too, there is actually talk about developing a Japanese summer abroad program, and that might be in the future, the next three or four years. To uh, return to the questions, uh, there is a question about uh, accelerated uh, tracks for heritage learners of a language. We do welcome heritage learners, and we do have a way of, of plugging them into our curriculum. I think every one of our uh, languages uh, accommodates heritage speakers and depending on what their needs are in terms of where are they in most in need of improvement. I've had heritage speakers of Russian in my elementary Russian class because that's where they needed to go. But we've also had heritage speakers come in at the advanced level and they, they're reading uh, Russian novels in Russian with uh, Professor Anna Maslenikova. So, and, and this is, uh, this is the, the beauty of the uh, programs in the MLC department. Uh, no matter where you come in, whether, you, whether your language proficiency is because of a heritage background or because you've studied it extensively, you will be able to come in at a level uh, where you can continue to improve that proficiency while you're exploring uh, content courses and language courses at the advanced level. I will also quickly address the other question about can MLC courses overlap the Take 5 program? And um, I'll turn that over to Professor Rosenzweig, who probably has uh, already experienced Take 5 students doing programs in areas uh, related to uh, French or other Romance languages in the department. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, there's a couple ways that this can happen. So um, the, the way that Take 5 works, uh, as I'm, I'm sure a number of you know, or most of you know, is that you often will take classes, you know, you'll, you're exploring a new avenue um, for you um, and you'll, you'll be taking content courses with other, with students who, who might be majors also. And so you're kind of, there's a, you know, a diversity of experiences in those courses. And so sometimes what people are really interested in for, um, in, in terms of um, the overlap between MLC and Take 5 is, is learning a new language. Right, and so maybe they really wanted to learn a language they haven't been able to. They would incorporate that into their take 
think five. Sometimes it has to do more with content and explicitly with, with literature or culture or film. And so some of our courses in MLC are taught in English and sometimes take five students would take those, you know, electives or upper level content courses in English, depending on their program of study. And then sometimes, um, you know, depending on what their level of the language is, they might be taking um, a upper level content course um, in the target language. And so it really, really depends because take five is so um, individual and sort of geared towards your, your personal research um, interests. It's there, are, you, you could be, you could be sort of um, plugged into different kinds of MLC courses um, depend, at, 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 at various levels of MLC. So the short answer to that question is yes, absolutely. There's lots of overlap and different kinds of overlap. And, and one other thing I'd add, and this is a, a fairly recent development in the last five to eight years, students are allowed to go abroad as part of their Take Five program. That is also a possibility. So. Uh, if you have a double major already planned, it doesn't look like you can do a major in MLC, but you're really interested in pursuing the study of another language uh, or, or, or culture as a take five, eight course sequence, uh, right up to and including study abroad, that's all possible to do. Uh, so keep that in mind as you're, as you're thinking about the take five experience. Uh, a question about learning multiple languages and a question about doing research. So the multiple languages, uh, you can do multiple languages. If you major in two languages in MLC or one language in MLC and one in classics, they're both humanities. Uh, so you'll have to make sure you get your other divisional requirements uh, lined up. But let's say you do both of your, you do two majors in our department. Let's say you do Russian and French. Uh, because our foundation requirements are the same for both majors, the two foundation requirements will account for both those majors and that way you gain two courses as a way of helping you cover the other divisional requirements that you would need to do. We've had students do this. We've had students do a, a language and a comparative literature double major. Uh, students have a, a lot of fun and uh, doing that and, and this has been one of the successful combinations. Research, we have had some uh, First of all, as part of your MLC major, you're going to do research in the MLC research seminar. It's in the title. It's what you do in the in the in the class. You learn uh, and practice uh, theoretically informed uh, analytical critical uh, analysis in uh, that results in a 15 to 20 page research paper based in uh, your uh, your language and culture uh, area. But beyond that, we have students who qualify for the honors program and write honors thesis uh, of, of 40 to 50 pages. I had a student write a 187 page honors thesis in Russia in, in, on a topic of, of pathology and belief in Dostoevsky. It's, it was like a dissertation. It was brilliant. Um, and uh, so uh, and we, have an, we run an annual undergraduate research conference here in MLC. Uh, our students also participate in uh, national research conferences through the research office, the undergraduate research office here on campus. Plenty of opportunities for research. I don't know whether my colleagues want to chime in on that question. Yeah, I, I would say in addition to all of those, I've had um, a couple of students now who are working on honors theses um, also help me with research that I was doing for my, my book. So I've been in the middle of working on a book on 16th and 17th century French theater. Um, I had a student who in the MLC research seminar was also interested in that, it overlapped. And I had her do a lot of, you know, um, searching databases for various kinds of articles, summarizing articles, finding new avenues for me. She would, another thing that she did that was really um, helpful was, sort of trace the trace the way a particular scholarly book had been received and reviewed. So all kinds of things to, to practice skills um, and, and develop skills, research skills that I think came in handy later. So that's another, that 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 is I think maybe less, um, uh, it, it really, you know, depends on how much your, your research would overlap with a particular professor, but there are definitely opportunities for that. And, and those, those kinds of collaborations with professors can be for credit 
and they can be for, for pay as well. So those are also possibilities. I, sometimes it's interesting to, to work uh, on a professor's research area because you learn a lot about the research process through that experience. Um, how many times can students study abroad over the course of the four to five years? I will say, I had a student who was a Russian uh, major who, 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 who took a year abroad and did a semester in Russia and a semester in Czech Republic. Uh, and the semester in Czech Republic was just sort of wanted to see another Slavic country, wanted to be in Prague for a while, uh, and was able to do that. Uh, again, it's a lot about organization, making sure that you have all your requirements lined up and you're taking your classes at a good pace. So that's, that's a, it is possible to do. And we have students who will also go abroad for a full year in just one country. I had a student go abroad for a full year in Russia, actually several, uh, came back uh, and then took my war and peace class and read war and peace in Russian because after a year in Russia, he could read the novel in Russian. So that was neat. And that was sort of taking the full year, but staying in one country. I just, I oh, sorry, go ahead, Professor Hardy. <laughs> I had a student whose major was Asian studies and then she actually uh, took the Japanese and the Korean simultaneously throughout the year, uh, her uh, university life. And then uh, she did study abroad in Korea uh, one semester, then right after she did a study abroad in Japan. I mean, it seems like it was very successful, but as uh, Professor Gibbons said, um, kind of a lot of paperwork to submit and then has to be kind of in order. So that part kind of need to be pay attention, but she did have a great time in both countries, Korea and Japan. Um, I was just gonna, uh, add something about go, to go back to the the question of research. One one thing that occurred to me too is that sometimes what happens is that when teaching a course, students will have really really interesting ideas that will push me to change what I'm thinking um, about a particular idea, or a particular concept, or a particular text. And so um, again, with this book I have in progress, I've had I've had. Actually, students actually, you know, in, influence the direction of my research, which has been really exciting. Um, so it's, that's another way that, that it can go. It's, um, I think, one of the benefits too of the class sizes in MLC tend to be tend to be quite small, and so you get a lot of interaction with professors. That's a that's a point that's worth emphasizing. Um, doing double majors, uh, the students. Uh, find that they get they get to know us better, we get to know them better than maybe the professors in their other department because the departments, you know, might, might be bigger or the class sizes there might be larger. So it we are often uh, the ones that they know the best and we often know them the best and we, uh, we are able to write recommendation letters that reflect our better knowledge of them as students, even though we're talking about them from a different perspective, from the perspective of their work in our department. So that's important. The other thing you need to keep in mind is that Rochester students um, are, are very um, intellectually curious and ambitious. And so while you're here, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, all the sort of all the bets are, are off the table. You can, you can pursue research, you can pursue uh, extended time abroad, you can pursue the study of multiple languages. Uh, it all really depends on you how you want to organize your time, how you want to reach out to your professors, how courses give you access to different opportunities. Uh, so I would just encourage all of you to really, um, you know, to really take advantage of that aspect of the Rochester experience. So I'm going to see as we're getting up toward the top of the hour, I think in our slideshow, we're just moving forward to well, here's a question. If, what if I'm interested in literature or culture class for language or culture I don't know? Well, that's what we have uh, the competitive literature program for. If you get on our website or on the, uh, the websites like the course description, course schedule website where you can look up what kind of classes are being offered, any of our courses that are listed or cross-listed with, with, with the competitive literature program are taught in English translation. So if you want to read uh, Dante, uh, but you don't know Italian, it's taught in English with Italian students, of course, doing some of the work in Italian. Uh, if you want to read uh, Don Quixote, but you don't know Spanish, well, that class is taught in English as well. Dostoevsky the same way. In Japanese and French and all of our programs, we have classes that are taught in translation so that uh, 
you don't have to know the language or have proficiency in that language to take classes that may that may rock your world and change your life. I mean, people who take some of these classes, well, like Dostoevsky, can come away changed. I have students who say that. So that's something we wanted to remind you of as well. Um, and I'm going to see what my last one. Oh, just a few recommendations here in as you think about your first semester. Um, I want to just point out that if you're going to start a language, uh, we do, and so at the elementary level, we do try to preserve space for you in our classes. We do create artificial caps on the enrollment so that by the time you guys come and register in August, uh, there will be space left in classes for you to occupy. We don't let them fill up uh, with upperclassmen, so keep that in mind. Uh, beyond 101s, uh, you can certainly look at 200 level classes taught in translation if you're unsure about your language ability to, to see, uh, you know, to explore uh, classes in your area of interest, even though your linguistic skills might not be up to the class if it were taught in the target language. Um, so keep that in mind. That's the content courses and translation option. And, and then uh, the plan B option, stay flexible. I mean, I had no idea coming into college that I was going to go into Russian. And I took it with an open mind. I even tried to drop it. <laughs> my, my professor kept me in and I'm very thankful for him because he's created for me a, a, a marvelous life. Um, uh, and, and this is true of, of all of our programs. You, you uh, step into these classrooms, you go abroad and you suddenly realize uh, you have an interest and a passion that, that you, you didn't suspect. So, uh, so plan B is, if all of these Spanish classes are full, take Japanese. You never know where it's going to lead you, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's the that's a advice uh, to keep in mind. I have a question here. Have any of you seen a student learn more than two languages at once? More than two languages? That would have to be people I think will come in with some heritage ability and then explore beyond that. Uh, I'll reach out to my colleagues if they have uh, stories uh, to uh, about any instances like this. I have one that jumps to mind as a student who is uh, uh, studying ASL that we should mention too, that there's an ASL American Sign Absolutely. Language program um, in another uh, department. Um, um, so ASL, okay, the student is doing ASL, French and Japanese, I believe. And then also um, came into the came into college with some knowledge of Hebrew and has continued her study of Hebrew. So there's one example. Um, I, I will point out, by the way, that speaking of ASL, our ASL program uh, has, uh, I think it's every other summer, has an ASL in France program where you go and you spend time in France learning French ASL, which is different from the American ASL. And uh, we, they, they qualify for the same Mildred Burton Traveling Fellowship if they're U of R students. So another uh, uh, thing to keep in mind. And I think one thing this highlights too is that like it all every, everything accumulates, right? So like your experience studying, you know, say your high school only had Spanish, like your experience studying Spanish is going to help you when you come and decide that you're going to you're going to start Japanese at the University mm -hmm. of Rochester, right? That they're 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 interrelated in terms of skills. Um, so those are the important links: our web page, our home page. Uh, and our undergraduate placement page. Again, just find the MLC homepage. All these links are clearly marked for you to discover. And I think now we're at the general question section. So I'm gonna stop the screen share and, uh, and uh, we're, uh, we still have five minutes before the top of the hour. If there are other questions, please don't hesitate to ask. We're happy to, to answer and to elaborate on anything that you might've asked earlier uh, from, um, previous uh, sections of our slideshow. Professor Rosenzweig, how did you come to French? Oh, I mean, th I, actually, this is related to what I just said. I went to a number of different high schools for you know various family reasons. And uh, the first one I went to, uh, I started uh, Italian. The next one I took Latin because they didn't have Italian, but they had Latin. And the next one I took French and I was really grumbly about taking French. And then I, when I went to college was a French and poli-sci major. 
Um, but I was very much like, I'm only doing the French, you know, to have the skills to do poli sci stuff. And then I just found myself, I kept taking more and more literature and culture classes and then cut to more years later than I'm going to admit here. Um, and now I'm a French professor. So it was another one of the, I kind of fell into it um, and was just really interested in the questions that literature and culture opened up, opened up for me. So. You know, it's, it, it, and, and pursuing language doesn't mean you're gonna end up being a professor, obviously. We, we all ended up as in, in the professoriate as it were, but a lot of our students uh, credit their time engaging with another language, going to other cultures, finding out as much about themselves abroad as about the, the culture in which they found themselves. They credit that time as really a, a, a crucial formative period in their life that set them, um, you know, that enabled them to uh, orient themselves and, 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 and their career goals, have a broader uh, perspective a more diverse out world outlook, a more tolerant world outlook, uh, that contributed uh, uh, serially, that contributed seriously to their to their future endeavors in careers that aren't directly related to us anymore. But we had that that formative role in their lives to help them find their authentic selves and their authentic interests. And remember, you're going to college to do that. You're going to come to the university to find out who you are what your authentic interests are, how you can be a better global citizen, and, and which we need now. We need good global citizens, regardless of whether you're going to be spending the rest of your life speaking Russian or doing something else in law school. One of my students now is a, a lawyer in, who does immigration law. That's a direct uh, outcome of her engagement with Russian and working with Russian immigrants. You never know how things are, are going to work out for you. So a recommendation to, to keep an open mind when you come to college. And uh, do keep in mind as well that regardless of what you do in this department, you're going to get a practical skill, some kind of proficiency in a language, in addition to all the wonderful intellectual, cultural, you know, a personality formative stuff that you're going to get. So we welcome you. Uh, we're, we're happy to, to, to see you. We're, we're um, a dynamic, a diverse, faculty uh, uh, whose classes I think you'll find relevant and, and intellectually gripping. Also, when we're allowed to be on campus all together, we often have pizza parties, so. Pizza is a, a big part of our life. <laughs> you will Very cross-cultural. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. I, I really appreciate the questions. It was a very lively Q&A, uh, and uh, it was great that we could answer them along the lines of uh, it's sort of in real time uh, on the lines of our presentation. We hope we've answered your questions. If other questions arise, please don't hesitate to contact us. You now know three people in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures and uh, feel free to drop us an email to say, hey, I was at your, uh, at your um, admissions event and uh, really in, in, you know, enjoyed hearing about the department. I do have some follow-up questions. We'll be happy to get back to you. In the meantime, we wish you well. And we hope to see you here next fall when we'll, we will be maskless and in person and not socially distanced. And we're really looking forward to that. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Good night, everyone. Thank you.